your title, do you go by Whiskey Scientist? Is there something more that you like to go by? I think Whiskey Scientist is the official one, so it's just easier to go off of that. Is it not like we don't need to put like a PhD behind it or anything like that? Or Oh, I don't think I can be talked into getting a PhD, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. You're listening to this podcast because you love whiskey. Well, if you didn't, it's probably because you're a family member of mine and you just want to see what I do with my free time. But in all seriousness, we all know that whiskey is an amazing product. It's a testament of a lot of different things. You have the art of blending their science and nature, they all come together to create something that didn't exist naturally. And during that process from grain to bottle, you can manipulate a multitude of variables to create a brand new type of whiskey or some flavor nuance that hasn't been discovered yet. And TX Whiskey, it's a growing brand and they have some strong pedigree of people working to shape their whiskey profile. Today on the show, we're joined by Ali Ochoa, who's their whiskey scientist. She analyzes, studies, and makes suggestions on what to do with finished whiskey at TX, but also has an influence during every step of the process. We talk about how she landed her dream job after college right there at TX Whiskey, and how she is learning about their particular barrel placements in the warehouses and discovering new types of finishes. With that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from My Bourbon Journal, who writes me on Twitter. How much influence does cocktail culture have on the spirits industry? Does the increased interest in bourbon lead to the increased popularity of an old-fashioned or Manhattan cocktails? Or do you think it's the other way around? First of all, great idea, and thank you, My Bourbon Journal, a very active Twitter account. I would say that cocktails open the door a lot more for bourbon than bourbon does for cocktails. And the reason why is that kind of uh, before flavored whiskey was around, the ideology behind like brands was to get people to drink a cocktail and then they eventually become like a, a traditional spirits drinker. And once you, be- or like a straight spirits drinker, and once you, once you really start drinking bourbon neat or just a little water or on the rocks, that tends to be what you like. You know, when you get into the connoisseur level, most people most people just kind of stick to that water or ice or neat formula versus going to a cocktail. And in fact, I'm guilty of that. I'm not the biggest fan of bourbon cocktails. There's a couple of that I like a lot. Like I like some old fashions. I love a black Manhattan. I love a perfect Manhattan. But my favorite bourbon cocktail is the Brown Derby. And I know Kenny and Ryan, they like cocktails a lot more than I do. But my world for cocktails is rum, you know. So I think rum is a category where if someone is a neat rum drinker, then they could find themselves into the the cocktail space a lot easier because there's a lot more versatility. Bourbon cocktails, there's not a lot of versatility there. There's most people are are really kind of stuck in that old fashioned or Manhattan world where with with uh, with rum, you got the tiki movement and any other kind of creation there. Like just rum lends itself better to mixing in a cocktail and bourbon. You know, I think it struggles, and that's why one of the downfalls it had in the '60s and '70s is that it didn't mix uh, well. At least bartenders could not get it to mix well. That being said, bourbon cocktails are awesome. It's more about the bartender than it is the recipe. That's very important to note. You just gotta gotta find the right bartender. And then uh, it's a home run. But to answer your question, I think cocktails lead to people becoming bourbon drinkers a lot more than the bourbon leads to cocktail drinking. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you are like my bourbon journal, you can hit me up on uh, fredminnick.com or follow me on Twitter and uh, hit me a note with what you'd like to see in Above the Char. That's going to do it for this week, folks. Be safe out there. Until next week. Cheers. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, 
Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to noseyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you could win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina, drink responsibly, and B21. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or the bourbonconcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It's another great episode of Bourbon Pursuit coming at you. Fred and Kenny here today talking to a distillery which we have never had on the show before, plus a, a great personality that we'll be able to kind of share and give a little bit more background about what she's been doing in this world. But I know for the longest time, and Fred, you might be able to correct me wrong, I had no idea whether it was TX Whiskey or Texas Whiskey. And it's just like you see a big TX on the label and you're like, oh, what is it? I'm for the longest time, I just, I kept screwing it up. Well, and let's be honest here, Any, you know, growing up in Oklahoma, anything that's Texas related, they put their stamp on it 30 times over. So there's like an assumption that TX would just be Texas. But I remember pretty early on, I got corrected on it. I think I called it Texas whiskey, like, no, it's TX. And, uh, I was like, all righty then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's one thing to say about Texas is they are proud of everything Texas as well. That's true. They back everything with Texas whiskeys and everything like that. And I think we're going to have a great conversation, learning more about the whiskey, but learning more about the person who is on the uh, the scientific side of things and kind of knowing how she really got into this realm. And I think it's going to be a great conversation. So let's go ahead and lead in our guest today. So we have Ali Ocha. She is a whiskey scientist from TX Whiskey. So Ali, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So before we kind of get into the whiskey and what you've been doing, let's kind of let's roll back the hands of time, as I like to say, and kind of talk about when you were growing up. Was there ever like an influence of, of whiskey in your family? Yes. I remember my dad always liked to drink whiskey, but that's actually not what hooked me onto whiskey. So it was just kind of there in the background and it, I saw it, but didn't really make too much of an impact at that point. So he wasn't making you like, go, go make me my, my bourbon and Cokes or my, my scotch and waters or anything like that growing up. <laughs> no, nothing like that. <laughs> All right. So then I know you also went to Texas A&M. Kind of talk about your time there and 
really, I think that was kind of your, your formidable years of, of kind of understanding the food science and process and everything like that. And I think you met a few key people. So I'll, I'll let you kind of give your, your long-winded background of, of how you got into it. Absolutely. And you're right. It is long-winded. So I already apologize. So it wasn't my dad that got me interested in whiskey, but it was a professor. And I just remember that the professor would always tell us about his travels. And at that point, all I wanted to do was find a career that would let me travel. But specifically, he told us a story about going to Scotland and how the whiskey from Scotland tasted very different from the whiskey in Tennessee, Kentucky, Canada. And this was just a very high level conversation of like grain, yeast, water. Now being here, like, yes, it all very much makes a difference, like every choice you make. But at that point, I just didn't know enough about it. But I was very interested in how different processes or different ingredients could give you a drastically different product. So that in itself led me to food science, uh, which I studied at Texas A&M. While I was there, they brought in people from ice cream, people from the meat industry, people from the coffee industry, people from cereal, from every single food item that you can think of. And while I love all of that, nothing really stood out to me as much as whiskey had. So whiskey led me to food science and then back to whiskey. During my master's, I was actually working on a coffee project, uh, getting a master's in flavor chemistry and sensory science. When another professor that was also working with the coffee project overheard me say that, well, I would love to work in coffee. I love coffee. I, what I really wanted to do was work with whiskey. So he volunteered to introduce me to a master distiller student that he had of his who happened to be Rob Arnold. Um, and I'm sure y'all know Rob and have talked to Rob and how um, early on he had like a very high drive to pursue terroir to see if he could prove terroir and whiskey. So what we actually ended up doing was uh, we teamed up and my master's project did some of the base work that he was trying to find out and research. He grew, I think, three to four different varieties of corn in three different areas of Texas with different climates, different soil types, different growing practices, made mashes out of them, distilled them, and then sent me the distillate so that we would train a panel in descriptive analysis, run flavor chemistry on the corn volatiles and the whiskey volatiles, and then run uh, proximate analysis or macronutrient analysis on the corn itself to see if there was a difference in protein, difference in fat, difference in starch content that could lead to different flavor development. Um, and then that itself led to a job with TX. Okay. There's a lot to kind of unpack there. So let's, let's kind of, let's take that, let's take that a little bit. Cause I think, I, I think we always love these episodes where we can get really geeky and nerdy on the science aspect of things, but just to kind of also get a little bit more personable on you, you know, you said you were attracted to whiskey, but what was it? Like, what was it about whiskey other than the fact that we all have a, a, a love for it because we just like the consumable, we like the way it tastes, but what was it about whiskey for you that really brought you back to it? The maturation, just like the science behind maturation and how it can be different depending on where you're maturing, the type of barrel you're using, the type of maturation system. It was just uh, a bit of a black box where we, you don't know everything and you really don't want to know everything. I feel like it takes some of the romance and some of the mystery out of it, but just getting a better grasp of it. But that was enough of a hook to, to really have me hone in on whiskey and want to only work on whiskey. So was it the, the science aspect of maturation or was it like a romantic of like the bottle, some marketing, some of the stories behind it? Is there something that, that you really liked or is it truly just the, the scientific portion of it? I think it was definitely just the science portion of it. And then as I started working more with it or even getting more in the industry, that's when I started to also drink the product. And not only that, but like really get drawn into the stories and the histories of whiskey itself, of brands themselves and how you've just seen them grown and evolve over time. But definitely the science was what hooked me. And you had also, I know I'd read somewhere as well is that you were also doing some stuff with a, like a coffee project before then as well. Can you talk about what you were doing with that? Yeah. So um, that project was a very large project that had a lot of different teams working on it, but our team had the fun part. We got to taste all the coffee. Essentially what they were doing is they were trying to see if different varieties of coffee could grow in different altitudes, different areas to be rust resistant, disease resistant, pest resistant, just because coffee can only grow in a really narrow area of the world or grow well in a really narrow area of the world. And with climate change happening, they were kind of having trouble being able to 
grow as much as they wanted. So it was a very large project that was across lots of countries, different varieties, testing to see what was successful and then would bring a good flavor. So again, we got to do the very fun part, which is drink coffee. But the way that we had to drink the coffee was with a couple of universities, we had to develop lexicons so that we would say, all right, we're going to evaluate blueberry and coffee, but we want to make sure that the team in Texas is evaluating exactly the same thing in Kansas, exactly the same thing in Oregon. So it would be a word to blueberry with a definition, and then they would give you very strict references of this is a blueberry at a two, a blueberry at an eight, a blueberry at a 15. So then we would have to identify and quantify. So we had to train ourselves on that quote unquote, like objective standard scale. And then we also had to recruit people and train them how to drink coffee. And I think we had a list of almost a hundred and eight attributes that we had to test on. So we had to go through training of all of that. Other departments, I think, worked with soil. Other departments worked with hybrids. So I think definitely looked out with the department we were working in. So one of the things that has really been really kind of cool with, with your story is there's not a lot of people with a title whiskey scientist. You know, there's distiller, chemist, blender, and, you know, there's a lot of like engineers in the in the business and everything. And and I, I was curious, like, you know, did you did you choose that title or did you all like have meetings about like, you know, what to call your position or it's just such a cool title. That's always the best thing is when you have to kind of grow into something and maybe you can kind of uh, mold and meld whatever it is that you want to be there. So when Rob was in the process of hiring me, he said, Ali, do you want whiskey scientist as your title or do you want quality analyst? And that was a really easy choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit, you know, while I've been here, I've done the chemistry role, I've done the quality role, I've done the sensory role, product development role, blending role. So covered a lot. So that title, it's just a fun title. It's a real cool title, but it covers a little bit of everything of the whole. I was about to say, how jealous are your friends? <laughs> I don't think jealous. They ask me for whiskey all the time. I think they're okay with that. <laughs> oh, that's the worst. You, you, you have, they're like always bugging you, right? Yeah, they're like, oh, you can you can bring the bottles over to the party this weekend, right? That's that's what you have. You work for the distillery. Always happy to share. My favorite release of yours was the, uh, I think it was the first or second cast strength. Now I haven't, I obviously haven't tasted everything, but I thought your cast strength was just awesome. Oh, thank you so much. I did really well in some some blind tastings too. Do you, do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite release over the years? I, I do love the barrel proof a lot. We actually just released a cognac finish not too long ago. And I think I'm loving the cognac finish right now. Um, it's done really well for us as far as we enter into competitions just to kind of get a, a gauge of how it's doing. But that one, I think, won best of class for special finished bourbons at the San Francisco Spirits competition this year. On a personal note, I love it because it is so hot here right now that all you need is just a couple of ice cubes in there. And it is the most refreshing whiskey I've ever had. Mm, okay. How long have you been at, at TX now? Because, you know, you mentioned Rob Arnold. For anybody that doesn't know, he was one of the founders of TX. He wrote a book on whiskey and terroir. And, and so did you come when he was building TX or when did you come into the picture? So I joined the team five years ago in 2017. We were still at the small distillery or at the original distillery. We're in within a couple of months of transitioning out here to the new distillery. So I got to hear a lot about the old distillery. I got to experience it for about five to six months, but I definitely got to be here at Whiskey Ranch, our new distillery from its beginning and or post-construction. And that's been a lot of fun to be able to see the whole system come up, understand how it works and just see the process and ev evolution of our products from when we started to what we're putting out now. And was TX your, your first job out of college? Yes. Yes, it was. I got the dream job right away. Golly. That, you didn't have to like, like do any like hard kind of cutting your teeth in the industry. You just went straight to whiskey scientists. I think there's a lot of people who'd be jealous of you. It was a lot of really good timing, really good timing, but it was, it's been great for the past five years. Yeah, as I would say, speaking, so you landed your dream job. Speaking of just like your, your entire life, have you ever had like a worst job that you ever had? No, I've liked, I've liked all of my jobs, but I've also had really fun jobs. I taught swimming. I taught water aerobics for like surgery rehabilitations. I worked in a sensory science kitchen. They've been fun jobs. 
So you're a swimmer? I used to swim. Like competitively? No, just more for fun. <laughs> we all swim for fun. We were just trying to figure out where you're going with it. Yeah, I was like, well, if you're teaching swimming, I was like, that's cool. <laughs> Same as a PhD. I don't think I could be talked into ever doing a swimmer's workout. That seems very, very rigorous. It's intense, yeah. And you always have to get in the water and it's super cold. And uh, I hate that. I hate that moment of getting in the water and like you don't want to get in, but then you get in there and you're ready, but then you get out and it's cold. I hate that whole sensation. We did have um, some pools while we were teaching that. Normally, you'd be cold the first five seconds, first 10 seconds. This pool, the second you stop moving, you'd be cold again. So it was, they motivated you to keep moving. Uh, yeah, I don't like that pool. I was say, it reminds me of like the Olympics. Remember you watch the Olympics and you see them go off and do a dive. They dive and what do they do? They get right out and they go into another pool. So they've, yeah. got, a, yeah. they've got something going on there. Uh-huh. Something, something that we haven't figured out. So we'll kind of bring it back to whiskey a little bit. So you've been you've been at TX now for almost what did you say six years, five years, five years. So during your time, as you've been experimenting, learning new things about the industry, and and kind of getting into TX in the the first case, what was kind of like your original like discoveries as you were starting to learn about whiskey? I know you were de- learning a little bit in undergrad. And you were helping Rob with some of the Terrar stuff. Like, what are your kind of big takeaways when you start looking at Texas versus basically everywhere else? So just overall, Texas climate is so, so completely different than anywhere else. The type of maturation, again, I love the maturation. So the type of maturation we get is, it's very intense. Right now, it's going to be 104 degrees today. So in our barrel barn at the top of the rick house, it's going to be easily over 120, seeing the kind of temperature swings we get. But also Texas has usually been pretty big about also getting Texas grain. So seeing the different types of varieties and how they play around or how they do in the whole ecosystem of the yeast, the environment. It's been different just in the flavors that we're able to produce. Also learn that no matter how much you read a book or you can like try to read in a book, you will always learn so, so much once you're actually on the floor. And I think that was something that coming from an academic background to a production background was, it, it was really nice. It was definitely a huge eye opener just seeing how, how much more intense everything is on the production floor. Since you've kind of just grew into this as Texas only, like were you able to figure out, does, it, does Texas make it more difficult versus going to somewhere else, another region of the country? Mm, I don't know if I would say more difficult. It's just different. It's just a different flavor profile, different process because you have to be able to produce in Texas, deal with the climate and the weather conditions in Texas. But uh, not knowing anything else, I don't know if it's more difficult. It just feels different. It's what you know, right? That's what you've you've grown up with. It, it's 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 kind of if you're dealing with it every day, you don't know what else is out there. I, I I understand that. So, what else have you kind of learned as part of the whiskey process there that? you know, makes it truly something TX. I mean, you, you mentioned the grains. What about the fermentation process, the water or anything like that? So with the fermentation process, that is something that at least here in Texas, you know, we have to make sure that we don't let the ambient temperature overheat the fermentation. We want to make sure that we're still having healthy, um, healthy fermentations. Bringing raw back into this, for, I'd say 90% of what we're producing we use a yeast that Rob isolated from a pecan nut and it's just been the house yeast strain that we use. So seeing those flavors whenever we do produce with that versus when we're producing with a commercial yeast, it's always fun to see those flavor differences. I think for me, I always try everything back to flavor and then how it matures and how it processes just because that's my most fun way of um, experiencing the whiskey through flavor and aroma. Well, Fred, I, I know I've eaten many a pecan pie in my life. I don't know if I've been able to extract a yeast strain from it. No, we had a we had a pecan tree that grew in our back backyard. It was enormous in like pecans are like a very familiar flavor profile, but um it's kind of one like I want to talk to Pat Heist of like, "Ooh, what what would uh what kind of yeast would a pecan yield, you know?" So, uh I I find that fascinating actually. But the pecan pecan trees are everywhere in Texas and Oklahoma. So, I can see that yeast is everywhere, right? So it's uh, I, I can see that being a part of it. But I, I will say I, I don't think I don't think that's been um, as widely publicized as it probably should be. Yeah, I was about to say, is that pecan nut still intact somewhere? And is it like in a in a 
glass case that people can see? No, but if we don't tell anybody, I'll go find a pecan nut and put it in a glass case <laughs> somewhere. You <laughs> and, you know, Rob did go to a farm or some land here in, in Glen Rose, Texas, and he got the pecan nut. And it was great for our marketing team as well, just because I think the pecan tree is a Texas state tree. And we still have the mother culture somewhere just to make sure that we're not switching too much, just because we really love the flavor that comes off of that yeast. Yeah, and that's such an American, you know, and I know it's, I know it's different, you know, Texas is obviously different than Kentucky, different than uh, Tennessee and India and everything, but it, it's it's still following the American, the American style of whiskey, like in Scotland, yeast is just not as important. And like the American style of whiskeys, like yeast is like, there's a story to it, you know, and there's an effort behind it. And I, I find that just fascinating. Quick question on the on the fermentation side. I, I don't really know those fermentation process. Are are you all are you all sour mashing, sweet mashing? What's your process there? We do a combination of both. We had a barrel barn that we were very close to filling up. So um, for a little bit, we had an on off schedule for cooking and for having um, for cooks. And if we had fresh back set available, we absolutely use it. Uh, we love this hour mash process. When we didn't have fresh back set, just depending on the schedule, we would just do a sweet mash. Would those end up being different types of products at the end of the day? Or did, were you able to kind of tell? Or were you just blending them all together to kind of mask that at the, uh, the end product? Or is it still TBD? I think a little bit still TBD, just especially since we have the barrel bar now and I I'm curious to see the impact of the barrel barn. We do still have the new make samples of it. And for the most part, the new make tends to be relatively similar, but it's how those acids and the sour mash will really interact with the oak later on that will, I think, make a, have a bigger impact on that end of things. But um, we're just now starting to get into some four-year-old product. So still trying to figure out how the barrel barn's aging. So sour mash is on that list of uh, variables just putting out bourbon, like vatted bourbon is kind of our number one goal at the moment. What cooperage are you all using? Talk a little bit about the the wood that y'all are using. So we work with ISC from their Missouri cooperage. When we started at TX or whenever I started at TX, they used about a three plus char with a kiln staves. And I've always been told a three plus because I had questioned what was a three plus versus a three versus a four. And they said it was... <laughs> We're all still kind of questioning in that. Yeah. They said it was a three and just a little bit longer and then they'd put them out. Yeah. Just a little bit extra. Just a little bit extra. So since then, we've also incorporated a couple of proprietary toasts and different char levels into our process just so that we could have... Well, so that I could have more of that painter's palette whenever it does come to blending. Okay. I mean, that's what you do a lot with the finished product side of things, correct? Yeah, I do. Um, I would say I do a lot more barrel to bottle, especially now that our team's grown, we're able to focus in a little bit more on different areas. Whereas before, I think we were all over everything for a while. That's what happens. You get a little bit bigger, you can hire some more people and you can reduce some responsibilities. But as you scale, those responsibilities kind of just grow a little bit larger too. I guess kind of talk us through the process as well as when you are taking it from barrel to bottle, sort of what's your process and what are the things that you're looking for to make sure that the, the product is, is meeting your specifications? If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point-of-sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. 
Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. I guess kind of talk us through the process as well as when you are taking it from barrel to bottle, sort of what's your process and what are the things that you're looking for to make sure that the the product is is meeting your specifications? So for barrel to bottle, things have changed a little bit. So we just recently started getting four-year-old product that was laid down here at our at Whiskey Ranch. And the big difference there was at our old distillery, we produced maybe three barrels a day. So that meant we had maybe 60 barrels coming of age in a month. Now we have about 40 or 80 barrels coming of age in a day. So at our old distillery, we would check every single barrel, check the profile on every barrel, blend barrel by barrel. Now we don't have the time. I don't have the time to check every single barrel. Uh, I think our team would hate me if I asked them to do that as well. Yeah. Pulling samples from all those, they'd, they'd be like, no, you get your own drill and go out there. Yeah. I'm okay without doing that. So I'm good not asking for every single barrel. But now what we do is because we do have a Rick house and this is my first Rick house. It's our team's first Rick house. We're trying to also learn how the Rick house is aging. So we'll ask for samples, like maybe 10 barrels out of 40 or 15 barrels out of 80. That is a mix from all over their aging locations. Check those barrels individually, kind of see what those profiles are turning out to. Um, I want to see if one corner is different than another corner, just flavor wise. And then everything's given a profile if they are different and we'll kind of profile them based off of their aggregate. So like if the Northeast corner is different than the Southwest corner with it's in the same group, those would be treated differently when it comes time to batting or to blending. So then we start looking at all those separate groups that we did, combining them and just trying to make the best version of bourbon that we can possible. We like to try to be consistent. And if we can't be consistent, we want to be better and right now, going from a pot still warehouse aged bourbon to a column still rickhouse aged bourbon, I'm not trying to pull my hair out. So we're just trying to be better at this point. And then once we get into our rickhouse a little bit more, then I'll worry about consistency. But we are happy with the product that's coming off of the column still. The other kind of question I want to kind of dovetail onto there a little bit as well is, you know, now that you're looking at taking things from your old distillery and things that are coming from the new distillery, by the way, that's got to be a, a big sigh of relief to be able to start having a little more scale, a little more things to taste from. Have you noticed in doing like column versus pot that you get a much more consistent product on the column side versus the pot? Column side is already coming off more consistent just from what I've been checking so far. Pot, by the time we were near the tail end of our pot distillations, we were pretty consistent there as well. And then our pot and column, there's just, there's very little comparison to those two. They are very, very different from one another. Yeah, I was about to say, I'd, I'd be much happier with, with the column still being able to crank out as much consistency and a lot more at, at the same exact time as well. Well, and the American styles are so column still, you know, you can still get a lot of the essence out of, uh, out of it that you do in a pot and pot just, it's a lot of work. I mean, if you can if you can perfect a pot distillation with whiskey, God bless you. But it's <laughs> it ain't easy. It's not. It's not. So more on the kind of like the uh, the finish side of things. We'll stay in where your 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 wheelhouse here of, of your your comfort level. So when you're going through and, and you're picking out the the certain lots, is there you know is when you're saying like oh, I'll I'll choose this one over here? Are you looking for places in the certain part of the warehouse and and trying to take those from different kind of just guide us through the process on, on what it is to be able to pull those sample lots. I think it's all driven by how we just filled our brick house. It's a freestanding ba- building. So we have to make sure that we're balancing it out and that we're not waiting it any one way. So it doesn't twist or have any um, bad accidents in there. So because of how we had to weight them, you almost start at the load bearings and then start working your way out per floor. So one group or one lot might have 
something on aisle 56 and aisle 13 and aisle 30. Again, just kind of depending on how they're trying to load it in. And right now the approach is I want those three aisles sampled to make sure that there's not flavor differences or to make sure that there are flavor differences, just kind of letting me know what profiles are there that I can play with. Are you noticing changes as you're pulling from different places at different times and, and kind of figuring out like, I hate saying that that sweet spot or the honey spot or whatever it is in a warehouse, but are you are you trying to, to figure out where those places are in the warehouse that are producing different types of flavors? We are trying. I will say that's going to be about a four-year process for me though, just because... Well, we had to load the first floor, then the second floor, then the third floor, so on. So right now we're only pulling for our product off of the first floor. I think actually today they might be pulling stuff off of floor two. So it's, I think it'll be more apparent differences as we start moving up floors versus more of the subtle differences on the same floor. And we do have a couple of projects. Again, there's no way that we weren't going to have projects run here with Rob Arnold as our master distiller. But one of those projects was putting uh, barrels on the outer corners on the first, third, and fifth floor on the inner aisles. Same thing, um, same distillation, same barrel type, just to see how those flavors are going to mature over time. And I think we're going to have a year three coming up this year. So we'll see how those flavors are changing. But we have seen at least at year one and year two, we have seen some differences in that maturation process. Yeah, I'd, I'd figure that's probably the scientific part of things that, that you know, you kind of get as part of your job there. You've got to be able to create some hypothesis of what you want to find and, and what you want to kind of get out of this at the end of the day. You know, you said that you're kind of pulling off the first floor, second floor, like, and I know that you said four years from now, which is great for job security, Right. You don't have to, you got you know, at least a few years to kind of figure it out. But do you have a hypothesis on how things are going to taste based on sort of where you're trying to place things? So right now off of the first floor, we're seeing a lot more light fruit, a little bit of tropical fruit. It just tends to be overall lighter character. On the third floor is where we're going to, th I think we're going to have the highest amount of oak influence, but even to the point where it might be just very, very oaky. And I think that middle floor is going to be, like you're saying, that sweet spot where we are still getting those fruit characters, but we're also going to start getting some of those sweet characters from the oak degradation products. Oak degradation? Okay, got to school me now. Oh, sorry, like um, like the vanillin or like the caramel flavors, the nutty flavors, the bready flavors, the stuff that comes from um, the oak itself. Get nerdy on us. Go ahead, throw throw some terms out there because there's NASA scientists that listen to this show, so they'll 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 appreciate it. Oh uh, well, it's just uh, especially from the lignin, like it's the lignin degradation products that give a lot of the um, traditional whiskey or bourbon taste, as well as the oak lactone. Uh, I think those are going to be very very concentrated on the fifth floor, just because that's where we have the highest amount of heat. We do have some airflow when we open the windows, but it's just. It's the highest heat, driest versus the bottom floor is going to be the lowest heat and even the more humid of the floors. Mm. And, you know, the bottom of the floor, too, whether it's dirt or concrete can have such a big impact in the location of where it is and approximation to a door. There's so much there. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, there was a company called Seagram's that studied all this and. Yeah, had all these calculations, and that's kind of like um, just a little company called Seagrams. A little company called Seagrams. They just <laughs> they kind of went away, and and the art of studying how things aged uh, kind of went away. And outside of like your observing kind of um, techniques, are you doing any like experiments or anything like that with like actual devices where you're measuring? you know, how much is being extracted from barrels or like uh, what the angel share are like, you know, since, since we got that, got the scientist hat on, I'm, I'm just fascinated with this. I, I wanted to know like where, where you are like kind of um, documentation wise, because that's so much a part of science. So right now, just with the equipment we have, it's all based on taste and aroma. We did try having humidity and temperature readers and the Rick house, and that was, we got some advice on what kind of humidity we want to have in there for optimal maturation. But just the advice came from a group in Kentucky, but there's just no way our climate was ever going to let us achieve that here in Texas. So it was more of a, well, 
we're just going to let go and let Mother Nature do her thing here. I am trying to lobby very hard to get some equipment so that we can start measuring oak extractive, so that we can start measuring just uh, even fingerprinting some of our whiskeys to see what is driving the flavor or the perception of flavor in those whiskeys. But right now it's just off of um, nosing and tasting. Interesting. Now, when you look at the the additional barrels you're bringing in, like like cognac, and this is still relatively new in American whiskey, these barrel finishes started in the late 1990s, but really did not blossom until like 2010. And there's not a lot of uh, data or even kind of conversational material of like how these like uh, secondary barrels fair in texas climate and i wonder if there was like something you could give us because like you look like you said at the top like texas's climate is so unique it gets so hot and humid there it it gets cold but not like here in kentucky and it's just so hot and so i was wondering like how has like the different types of barrels held up in the in the climate there i was about to say texas has gotten like their first snows in forever these past what two years or something like that it's been their, their climate's changing down there apparently yeah and when when it does get cold it likes to hold on for two weeks and close down the roads i, I was about to say i was like we in kentucky we we get snow and we're really not prepared for it. we're not michigan or wisconsin but there's no way texas could even handle a little bit of ice that's for sure <laughs> no that was uh those were a rough two years so as far as the different finishing styles you know, we have the the before a uh, sample, of the before aggregate, then the final sample. So this is actually something we were talking about not that long ago. Is that when we originally started testing these styles, we were filling them with pot still distillates, so already kind of that oilier, heavier character. Well, then if we did a trial with port and sherry that are fortified wines, they definitely had a peak where it's like, all right, they're at their best. And since then, they've just changed. They've developed into they're not as nice as what we liked as much when we first started like harvesting them. But we're actually kind of curious to see if using a column still distillate, that's already a little bit lighter, I guess, compared to the pot still distillate, if that will have a little different maturation with those finishes, if they can go longer, if it'll be a different product overall. And that's just something that we kind of started bringing up this year to see if that's something that we can look into the future because whiskey is a game of patience. Yeah. Another question kind of going into the finished category is the reason of, of doing that is just kind of looking at consumer behavior. Is it looking at knowing this is kind of where trends are kind of going? What was what was the idea of even getting into the finished barrel category? I think we were just curious to see what we could do with it, what flavors we could really get out of it, what we could make TX into a slightly different product with. And we do have a ton of finishing barrels, some that will never see the light of day. Why, why is that? I'm I just don't think the quality is great. And I, I will fight with every bone in my body to make sure they do not leave the Rick house. And it's just, it, it didn't work, but it was interesting to see style wise, what works with our bourbon, what doesn't work with our bourbon. We tend to test everything out in the lab as much as we can anyway. Um, and there's just some combinations that didn't work for us. I might be a very harsh critic or our harshest critic, but I personally don't want to release anything or show anything that I don't think is going to be a, a good product or liked. Well, that's admirable, but you know what my next question is going to be is which ones didn't work? You know, I think when we first started, when we were still at the old distillery, we tried a couple of single malts and just um, our single malts were all grain and process and off of the pot still. And I think we put those in some of the, um, like a port and sherry. And while it did, it's not that they were bad. They just weren't as good as like the bourbon was in that port and sherry category. And I think we kind of set like a bar and then we don't ever want to go below that bar. And it's just, it wasn't bad. It just wasn't as good as the bar that we're willing to kind of set for ourselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where your quality analysis comes in, right? Uh, well, whiskey science. Whiskey yeah. scientist. Whiskey okay. scientist. Let's be clear here. Uh, you know, one of the things that's happening right now in Texas is like there's all of these brands coming online and you see a little fighting kind of within the Texas whiskey community, like with Source Whiskey and a few things. It plays out in social media and 
maybe behind closed doors, but uh, how involved are you with like the Texas Whiskey Association or or some of the more trade centric things? Because I was curious to know like if we are close to any kind of Texas whiskey standards that would you know give it some umph over the years. So I'm trying more and more to get involved with the Texas Whiskey Association. One thing that I think is pretty normal across all whiskey is that production always gets along with one another, always willing to help one another out. And I've been very fortunate that I've met great people on the production team or in the craft distillers, it's a production marketing and sales team, but everyone is just super inviting and very kind trying to get there. But I think Texas Whiskey Association is trying to put in some standards as far as uh, where you get your grain and where it's matured and bottled and distilled. So um, that's something that I think already is something that you can get certified for in Texas. Yeah, they're trying to make that a law for Edwards, kind of like what we saw with Indiana rye. Yeah, I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it in Missouri, Indiana, Kentucky, obviously. But uh, Tennessee, Tennessee whiskey has that too in the state of Tennessee. But I think like these states that are really kind of growing and capitalizing want to prevent, for lack of a better term, fraud. I mean, the whiskey business is not filled with choir boys. You know, it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, kind of it's a lot of stories. Uh, there's a lot of stories. There's also a lot of shenanigans that go on. Like, I mean, I could very much see somebody buying MGP distillate and aging it in Texas and calling it Texas straight bourbon. And I think that's the kind of thing that every state should be looking to prevent that has that has some power in th- that term, Texas whiskey or Colorado whiskey or whatever. But I don't know. I just feel like I feel like uh, Texas should protect itself from uh, from that sort of thing. And I know there's there's efforts there and there's people who call everything out all the time. But um, I don't know. I think there's something precious. I think there's something great about Texas whiskey and and TX is definitely a part of that story. Are there any other brands that you have found yourself just to be a big fan of there in Texas? Oh, absolutely. Huge, huge fan of Iron Root, the team and the product. Absolutely love them. And again, I think my con- my connection to the brand will always come down to the people. And it's just the people that I think for me make the brand and make me want to go toward that brand. But yeah, no, Texas is doing a lot with we're trying to do that certification process to make sure that if you're calling yourself Texas, that you are meeting certain standards to become Texas. Yeah. And so I guess the next kind of phase in question as we kind of start wrapping this up a little bit is to kind of talk about what's on the, the horizon and kind of things that, that you've been working on there at TX and what can people start really looking forward to? You know, I feel like we're always working on something new here, but definitely just... It's okay. Spill the beans. There's <laughs> Everybody that's listening signed at NDA. You're fine. I want to keep my job after this. So, um, no, well, I, I do think, you know, our bourbon is going to be changing here for a little bit. So I think it's for the better doing our best to, again, we're not going to be consistent to what it was in the past. Just it's not a pot still product anymore, but seeing that change and that development of the 901 bourbon to the whiskey ranch bourbon is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we always have something that's a distillery only release that is an experimental. Uh, if that ever does well, then it can be considered for joining our regular SKU. We'll see what finishes we keep playing with. That for us has been something that's just been a lot of fun to kind of give ourselves a little bit more variety um, and just seeing what other whiskeys we have that are still aging that are ready to go to market hopefully soon. Right. And, and I guess uh, I got a few more follow on questions now. So when you were talking about the the old, you say 931, was that the old location? 901, yeah. 901, sorry. So you take that with the, with the new location. Are you trying to blend these two together to kind of create a, a, a new product that's going to be coming out? Or should I say that is going to fit the TX profile? Or are you trying to keep those two separate? No, it's definitely being used with the, the Whiskey Ranch bourbon to make the bourbon, the barrel proofs recipes we have. We did disconnect the pot stills back in 2018, though. So at some point, we will no longer have pot still bourbon available. So it's just uh, being used in transition to kind of help out the bourbon and just having some continuity, but it, it's still an overall different product, but one that overall we've liked a lot better. Mm. 
And so, the, sorry, last question, and I'll leave it to Fred there, is he also talked about experimental releases in there. And are these things that, that you have a hand in and trying to figure out what do we expect the, the outcome to be at the, at the end of the maturation cycle? Oh, so um, the experimental releases, that one belongs to the entire production team. So our distilling team, our blending team, me, our quality team, that one, it's when we were at our old location or even here when we've done like little one-offs, it's how we want to use them, but we can't really release them for a big release just because we might only have five to 10 barrels of it. So we'll release something here, but it's usually meant to look at an aspect of the traditional whiskey making process. So like the effects of grain, the effects of yeast, the effects of maturation or blending, which is a combination of all of that uh, or finishing. So it, it changes every time. I think the first two releases we did were a rye whiskey and a high rye bourbon. And then we did a blended bourbon. And now we have a couple more coming out this year as well. Uh, one, one point of a uh kind of clarification or correction that i said earlier uh the texas whiskey association does have a certification program for their membership but it's not uh state so i think that's you know what i was getting at earlier but uh what are the things that you all did um last year and i always get excited when i see this you all released a a, a bottled and bond and and i know you've got blends you got finishes but bottled and bond is such a hallmark to uh to american whiskey Will we see more bottled and bond uh, releases? I I think so. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I think so. Um, our single barrel is our bottled and bond, and hopefully we'll have a couple more going here in the future as well. Can't make any promises there, but we can always just push from our end what we would like to see as consumers and what we want to drink, having full access to our stock. But I think there should be a couple more bottled and bond that can be released or added. That's good to know. So if you're a big fan of TX Whiskey, go ahead, sign the petition now, get it over there and say, we want our bottled and bond. <laughs> it's not how it's happened. But Ali, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show, kind of sharing a little bit about your story, talking about your background and what you're doing over there at TX. If people want to know more about you, follow you on social handles or anything like that, or learn more about TX, how do they do that? So for TX, we definitely have an Instagram and Facebook account uh, at TX Whiskey. Mine is at TX underscore Ali, which is A-L-E, or I, people have called me Ale before, so thank you for clarifying before the podcast <laughs> began. I figured, it, I don't want to confuse you with a beer. It's happened before, often, very, very often. But yeah, we'll we'll try to kind of share what's going on here at the distillery. Um, so it's, it's always fun for us people to come by and just visit us and get to check out our facility. Right on. Really cool. So make sure you follow Ali, not Ale. It's not your favorite beer. It's not an IPA. But make sure you follow Ali. You also follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts on all the socials. Follow Fred Minnick on all those socials as well. But with that, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>